It is a joy for me to be with you today. For those of you who do not know me, I am Holly Tapley. I am a, a deacon in full connection with the Great Plains Annual Conference. And my appointment is the disaster response coordinator. So um, that is why you do not see me a lot. I am uh, on the road more than I am in Topeka. But it is a joy to be here this morning. Um, I guess my, my second compassion after disasters would be uh, being able to preach, even though I am not an elder. But as part of uh, being a deacon, we also proclaim the word of Christ. And there is nothing closer to my heart than being able to proclaim Christ. Let me also say that we were unable to locate the, the small microphones today. So that is the reason why we are here in the lectern side. So uh, if any of you on this side want to move over, feel free to. Uh, I understand that. But uh, we're just glad to be together today as we worship in spirit and in truth. Several weeks ago, when I uh, first broke my foot, I searched my house high and low for the walking boot that I had used several years ago on the other foot. If you ever, yeah, if you ever need any orthopedic equipment, I got everything you need. <clears throat> Even now I have a scooter, uh, so you are willing to borrow it. But I looked in boxes that are still unpacked from moving here in 2018. Yep, one of those. I went in the garage. There's boxes in the garage that I still have not even brought into the house to unpack. I went through those boxes. I went back into the bedroom to where all the boxes of books are. I went through all of those. I went down to the basement, even though there's only a bed and a table and a TV down there. But I still thought, well, maybe, maybe it's there. I was fussing, cussing. Yep, I admit it. Uh, <clears throat> because I knew that boot was there. And I, I remembered it clearly. I'd used it, uh, but I couldn't find it. So, you know, it being def de deflated, there it was. No rejoicing to be had, especially knowing that I was going to have to go buy another one. And I especially was deflated when the insurance company denied the payment of it. <sighs> no joy. Yet it might have been a different story if I could have found it, if I could have immediately put it on and grabbed my walker or my crutches or my cane or whatever, but that not being the case, I was hobbling around the house, grumbling at the dog who was looking at me like, I know you're crazy, but you know, this has got to stop. I couldn't figure out in all the noise that was going on in my mind and in my heart about a boot, I could not figure out where it could be. My wandering around and the noise of everything going on was probably nothing like the noise of the Pharisees and the legal experts. Did you, did you catch what they said in the gospel reading? This man, Jesus, this man, Jesus, welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. How dare he go out? How dare he go out to people who are not like us? How dare he go out to people who are called sinners and lost? He's supposed to stay in the midst and in the mission and in our inner circle. How dare he? And in the midst of the noise, Jesus begins to tell a story and then another story. 
He gathers the crowd and the eavesdroppers to whom he is really talking. And he says, suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't you leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost until you find it? Now, can't you hear the noise again? Can't you hear the mumblings again? Leave 99 just to go find one? Has this man lost his ever-loving mind? What is he saying? I got 99. Why do I need this one? But yet in my heart and in my mind as a Christ follower, I see the shepherd instead. I see the shepherd as he's walking around and walking around and looking and probably calling that sheep by name because I bet that beloved sheep has a name. And he goes and he looks and he looks and then he goes back to the 99 and he's counting. It's like when I used to be a youth director and we'd go places, I was constantly counting heads. Have I still got every one of them? Please tell me I got every one of them. And I can see the shepherd doing that, counting the head. Oh, still 99. Still 99. But then, you know, I, I think I'll go one more time. And the shepherd goes out, and the shepherd begins to look, and here comes the lost sheep. Can't you see it? I can imagine that both are probably running towards one another and, and maybe even a happy embrace there. Because, yeah, it's a sheep, but it's a beloved sheep. The sheep's probably hungry, the sheep's thirsty, and the shepherd cares for the, the needs. Before the shepherd picks up the now found sheep and places it on his shoulders, I can just picture the joy that was in his eyes as he carried it home. And then we hear, hear the shepherd say to the family and the friends and those along the way, come celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. Come on, we're going to have a party. We're not eating the sheep. But come on and be a part of our party because what was lost is now found. In the noise of our lives, when we are tending to our needs, Jesus reminds us that our relationship with him is not passive. Jesus is saying to us, saying to me and you today, in the same way I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and mind than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their heart our lives. And the second story is this is like that of the first. The woman, if she, you know, owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, you know, lights a lamp and sweeps the house carefully until she finds it. And she, like the shepherd, makes a big deal to celebrating that that which was lost is now found. And the picturing of the people celebrating with the woman over her, her found coin and the noise that has taken place, Jesus again says to those standing around, in the same way I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. I have decided, that's scary when I've decided something, but I have decided that the noise of life has taken over each and every one of us 
not just here, those listening today on YouTube and, and everybody else in the world. I've just decided the noise of life has just taken over and it has closed our ears to what we really need to be hearing. It has closed our, our eyes to what we really need to be seeing. We've become the deaf and we've become the blind because of the noise that is taking place. The noise has become more important than the one who has given us this life and made us in his image. But through these two stories and in many other stories that we read in the Gospels, Jesus seems to be suggesting a different approach to us, a different understanding, a different relationship. You know, we're pretty content with the 99, aren't we? We've all gotten pretty content, myself included, with the 99. Why, you know, why do I need to, to go find that one? We're pretty content with life. But Jesus is calling us to a different relationship. If you hear those words in the same way I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. So that's it. That's the key to the lost sheep or the lost coin. It's a different relationship that Jesus is calling us to. Jesus is calling us to go and seek to go and seek. Now that's hard work. It is hard work. But yet we're given the work to do. If we take this upon us, as we have said when we made the vows into the church to support it with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and... Share, share. We, we've taken those vows to share. We're seeking with joy. We're seeking something precious, something essential. And when we find those that we are seeking, we celebrate we rejoice, Jesus says. That the information that Jesus wants us to, to, to be sent out and to go is, is a different way of life for us in 2022. In the 60s and in the 70s, when I was growing up, it was expected for us to be at church. I mean, the preacher expected you to be there. Your Sunday school teacher expected you to be there. Your neighbors expected you to be there. And because all of the family came to the same church, all the aunts and the uncles and the grandmamas and the granddaddies were all expecting you to go there and be there. And co-workers of my dad was expecting us to be there and vice versa. And I can tell you that by the time my father got home at 5.15 on the dot on a Monday afternoon, we knew why this family was not at church on Sunday. It's because someone was sick. Or we knew why this family was not at church on Sunday because their, their, their father died. It was part of that Christ living to know what was taking place with one another within our community of faith. It's just the way we did it. My paraphrasing of verse 7, there will be more joy and celebration over the changing of the head and the heart of one sinner than of the 99 who think we're the perfect, God-loving, Christ-living disciple of Christ. Stings, doesn't it? Christianity is not a private way of life. You remember in Matthew 28, 
verse 19 that we can all say with our eyes closed and backwards and forwards and up and down when Jesus gives us the authority to go into the world and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We cannot go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ unless we are a disciple. Unless we are a community of faith. Today, Jesus is calling us for that different relationship. One that seeks out another. It will call us to invest time that is required and that is needed to seek out the lost and just someone who is not in attendance at church. Maybe it will call out for us to just to really get to know the person sitting next to us. How many of us are the one who seeks? The Episcopal Church, a couple of months ago, held a survey, uh, conducted it with 3,119 individuals 18 years up. And here was the results given of just one question. 48% of mainline Protestants consider their relationship with Jesus private. 48% of us consider our relationship with Jesus Christ as private. 8% of those 3,118 people said it was public, public. and 9% said they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. 48% says it's a public thing. Matthew 28 says to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Story after story that Jesus told us. Go and find the one sheep. Go and find the one coin. We watch Jesus as he goes through the towns and the villages, and he has compassion and he has care for those who are troubled and need help. No wonder our churches are not full. And I'm not just saying United Methodist, but I'm saying across the, the, the spectrum. No wonder we have empty seats, that we struggle for finances. I always like when I go to another church to preach, is asking the pastor, when's the last time you baptized an adult? When's the last time you had people join your congregation? And I don't do that out of meanness, but I do that because it's passion to my heart that Jesus has given us the authority to go into the world and to make disciples. We need the community. We need one another. But somewhere along the way, and I'm, I'm guilty, those of us who teach and preach, we lost, we lost the authority. We lost the authority, and, I, and I, take, I take my responsibility. In Christian education, in the mid-90s, when, when soccer practice started on Sunday mornings at worship time, and I remember to this day, because it haunts me, I was in the church parking lot talking to a family who was leaving early worship, and they said to me, you will not see us in Sunday school anymore because soccer practice begins at 10 a.m., and we're going to soccer practice instead of Sunday school. And it haunts me because I didn't have a conversation. 
about the priority there. I just kind of ducked my head and let them go. But somewhere along the way, those of us sitting in the pews, we didn't hear that being the church means going out and seeking the lost and others to come and join us. It is hard work. Again, we hear the words of Jesus from verse 7. In the same way I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their heart and lives. So you asked, how do we begin to do this? How do we begin to seek the lost? How do we begin to seek those who are not here? How do we, how do we seek out that person that we know but we really don't know? Three things. You know, we got to have three points. Our starting point is answering the question, how is it with our personal soul? How is it with your soul, John Wesley would ask. So how is it with your soul? Is there a deep connection with God? Second thing is in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, the message version, we hear these words from Jesus. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learning on the job can't get any easier than that. And the third thing is, is accepting that authority from Jesus that was given to us in Matthew 28. There's more joy over one than over 99. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.